Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Hot on the heels of SpaceX's Starship blowing its top, NASA is now getting in on the exploding tanks with the hydrogen tank from the first stage of their SLS. This obviously looks pretty catastrophic. The entire side of the tank has blown away, but the good news is that this was actually intentional. It was part of the whole testing program for the SLS. This is just the hydrogen tank from the first stage, and it's on a test stand where they've been simulating flight loads and then pushing it to its limit to see what it could handle. Now, as I understand it, this failure was somewhat different from the SpaceX failure. The SpaceX failure was just due to pressure in the tanks. In this case, it was in a test rig where they have hydraulic rams pushing up against the bottom, as well as tank pressurization. And they had it at 260% of the flight loads for about five hours before it buckled under the load and the side popped out due to the internal pressure on the tank itself. But these catastrophic tank failures are sort of only tangential to what I want to talk about today. You see, I talk about rockets and I also talk about rocket failures because when rockets fail, it can be spectacular. In fact, there are a lot of rocket explosions on my channel. It's to be expected. Rockets are full of explody stuff that is barely being contained as it flows through the engines and explodes in a controlled manner. With all these explosions on the channel, some of you might get a little uh, explosion fatigued, let's say. But also some of you might wonder, has a rocket ever imploded? Well, as it happens, yes, they have. This is an Atlas D Agena. That means it's an Atlas rocket with an Agena second stage. During fueling of this rocket, they had an issue which led to the pressure being lost in the oxygen tank on the first stage. And the whole rocket essentially imploded because the pressure inside those tanks is what kept the rocket rigid. The Atlas rocket was designed to be as light as possible and it used balloon tanks. That is tanks that got their rigidity by being pressurized. In this case, the oxygen tank lost pressure. The fuel tank underneath it was fine because it was still pressurized, but it eventually got took down by the weight of everything collapsing on top of it. You can just about see the fire suppression system activating since all the kerosene from that first stage was spilled everywhere. According to space historian Joel Powell, this was likely a dress rehearsal for the launch of the KH-7 Gambit spy satellite. And uh, that would normally have been the payload on top of this, but this likely didn't have anything on it. According to the serial numbers of what was lost and what was destroyed, there wasn't a payload on this. According to the information we have, the liquid oxygen loading system developed gas bubbles, and instead of flowing smoothly into the tank, it developed an oscillation, at essentially making a fluid hammer effect, which knocked the valves off or knocked the connections off, and allowing the, le the oxygen to leak out, and once that leaked out, the gas leaked out, and the thing lost its pressure, fell over, and that was the end of that. The use of balloon tanks on the Atlas rocket made it way lighter than it would otherwise have been. In fact, the Atlas is the nearest thing we have to a single stage to orbit vehicle. Instead of dropping fuel tanks, it just drops its heavy booster engines and then the rest proceeds into orbit. And while it seems a little risky to have a rocket whose entire structural integrity depends on the tanks being continuously pressurized, uh, it was it did continue to be used right up until 2005. All the Atlas variants right up until the Atlas 3 used the balloon tank design. Only the switch to the Atlas 5 brought in modern tanks that were rigid and therefore the Atlas 5 was also able to take solid rocket motors. Now that earlier example isn't the only case where the Atlas balloon tanks failed. For Mariner 6, the mission was getting set up on the pad and an electrical problem caused helium valves to open and the upper tank started depressurizing. As the Atlas began to crumple under the load, a pair of pad technicians quickly activated a manual override switch and they were able to you know, stop the rocket collapsing any further. The rocket at that point was essentially unusable, but the payload with Mariner 6 was saved and they were able to take the Centaur upper stage and uh, move it over to a fresh Atlas booster. It was actually the Atlas booster that was going to be used for Mariner 7 and Mariner 7 then got its own uh, fresh booster. The technicians are Bill McClure and Char 
Charles, uh, Charles Beverlin, and they actually get a medal for their bravery. And not only that, there's actually a place on Mars which is named the McClure Beverlin Ridge in honor of their quick thinking, you know, life saving or rocket saving exploits. Not all of the depressurization accidents happened on the ground. If it happened in flight, it, the vehicle would obviously lose structural integrity. And there was a few cases where this bulkhead separating the fuel and oxygen tanks failed because the fuel tank got depressurized and essentially it collapses downwards. This happened with Atlas 7D, an early test flight which uh, happened a month after the Mercury 7 astronauts had been selected. The liftoff went fine until about a minute into the flight when the vehicle just disintegrated in a ball of fire. Gus Grissom reportedly reacted by saying, are we really going to get on top of one of those things? Post-flight analysis showed that as it launched, one of the pins that were in the hold-down system ruptured a helium line leading to the... Uh, pr the fuel tank losing pressure and the bulkhead collapsing and destroying the rocket. And the balloon tanks also complicate museum displays since these things need to have a compressor or something else to maintain internal tank pressure or the vehicle will collapse, like the one did at the Air Force Museum in Dayton in the 1980s. The design of the balloon tanks is largely credited to Karel Bossert, who was the uh, essentially the lead designer of the Atlas ICBM. And although the Atlas was not a great success as an ICBM, owing to its requirement for cryogenic propellant, it obviously had a long and illustrious career as a launch vehicle. Now, after Atlas, he went on to work on the Centaur upper stage, which is the high energy upper stage burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to put payloads into their final orbit. And this is also still in use today. And also, the Centaur uses stainless steel balloon tanks to minimize the amount of weight in the vehicle. The skin thickness on the original Centaurs was 0 0.015 inches. That is less than 0.4 millimeters, less than half a millimeter thick. And that's one-tenth of the thickness of the skin of the Falcon 9, which also includes structural bracing inside. And regardless of any misgivings about balloon tanks, the Centaur has been a hugely successful launch vehicle. It's been launching payloads for over 50 years now, and it still flies on the Atlas V. It's also worth noting, incidentally, that when they use the large payload fairing for the large payloads, the payload fairing actually encompasses the Centaur, whereas the smaller ones, the payload fairing starts on top of the Centaur. But this means that the Centaur with his balloon tanks has flown longer than the Atlas did with its original balloon tanks. In fact, when I went looking for stories of Centaurs being damaged by pressure loss, I found this one from 1987, where NASA engineers managed to puncture the tank and it had to go in for repairs. And this specifically says this is going to be the last Centaur used by NASA. This is in 1987. Over 32 years ago, NASA thought it would stop you launching stuff using the Centaur, and they're still doing it today. And guess what? The Vulcan, which is ULA's next generation launch vehicle that will replace the Atlas, it is going to continue using the Centaur with its good old fashioned stainless steel balloon tanks. So indeed, there are pieces of space hardware which are not only designed to handle the pressure, but are designed by the engineers to use that pressure to make them as light as possible. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.